This is RTV6 News at 6, working for you. Only on RTV6, a mentally ill truck driver caused a crash and killed a mother and her twin daughters. Call 6 Investigates uncovers how he was able to get a license in the first place. A chaotic scene on the west side, a shooting and four vehicle crash. A woman is dead, a man is hurt. We are live with new information coming in. We just need more. We need more support in those areas. We're uncovering a disparity in home values across Marion County. A study finds it's impacting predominantly black neighborhoods. What experts say needs to happen. A dry stretch of days straight ahead and cold as well when temperatures will plummet into the lower teens. Good evening and thanks for being here with us at 6 o'clock. I'm Mark Mullins. And I'm Amanda Starantino. Every day we're working for you. So that means our mission is to expose potential dangers to you could encounter and then hold those in power accountable. It's all in an effort to keep you informed and safe. Tonight we are getting answers after a mother and her twin daughters were killed in a crash. A mentally ill semi-truck driver behind the wheel. Call 6 Investigates is digging into how this man, Bruce Pollard, was able to get hired and get a valid commercial driver. License. Kara Kenny uncovered documents that show Pollard got the green light just months before the deadly crash on I-65. Kara. We obtained these federal documents that show Bruce Pollard passed a doctor's medical examination in February 2019 and again in May 2019, just months before the deadly crash on I-465 that took the lives of three people. It was a midsummer day, July 14th, 2019. Alana Kuntz was driving with her twin daughters, Ruby and June, on I-465 when a semi-truck plowed into them. Their vehicle caught fire, killing all three. Behind the wheel of that semi, Bruce Pollard with Weston Transportation out of Missouri. Police noted he showed no remorse and told officers he was on a lot of medicine for his anxiety. His own attorney, Jack Crawford, questions why Pollard was operating a semi. He clearly should not have been driving a 60,000 pound heavy truck uh, on the interstate highways uh, in July of 2019. Uh, he shouldn't have been driving. And that's another question in this case. How did he obtain his CDL license? Great question. One Call 6 Investigates is getting answers on. This month, a Marion County judge accepted Pollard's plea of guilty but mentally ill on charges related to the deadly crash. Five minutes with Mr. Pollard, I think, would convince anyone that he has a mental illness. Medical records submitted to the court show Pollard was treated for a variety of psychiatric illnesses in 2015 and 2016, including schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Further evaluation revealed Pollard had lesions on his brain and was taken to the ER four times for confusion and agitation that could not be controlled. I'm not really quite sure if the patient can drive, read one medical record. Fast forward to May 2019. Call 6 Investigates obtained these records that show a Missouri doctor found Pollard qualified for his medical certificate. That means Pollard passed a state medical exam just months before the crash. Crawford says Pollard was able to use that required medical certificate to get his Missouri commercial driver's license. That should have been noticed by someone and he should not have received his commercial driver's license. Our sister station KSHB reached out to the Missouri Department of Revenue, the state agency that issues CDLs, to ask how Pollard got his CDL. But a Missouri spokeswoman says she can't comment because there is an ongoing investigation. Call 6 Investigates did some checking and found medical exams for truckers include cognitive and behavior testing, and drivers are asked to disclose any history of mental illness. Gary Langston is president of the Indiana Motor Truck Association. It's an extensive evaluation. Um, the unfortunate part about that is that, um, you know, the, a person who might have some issue might not have an issue that day. And they might not, it might not be readily uh, identifiable. The trucking industry relies on state certified medical examiners to clear drivers, at least health wise, to get behind the wheel. This is a, a really important job that subjects these people to the general motoring public every day. And if, if those kinds of things are problems, it's important that we know that. 
Best West Express out of Vincennes says when they hire drivers, they look at driving records, background checks, and of course, whether someone passed a medical exam. But President Eli McCormick says no system is foolproof. We've seen it in the past where, you know, so a driver that's diabetic is not allowed to drive a commercial vehicle that's insulin dependent. Um, they're just not. But we've seen it in the past where some of that stuff slipped through because the medical examiner didn't catch it. That system on that side is a little alarming. Um, if we're being honest. Weston Transportation in North Kansas City hired Pollard in June. Records show Pollard lied about his driving record and employment history to get that job. They've declined repeated requests to talk about Pollard. McCormick says his company vets candidates as much as possible, including meeting them in person. I think it comes down to honesty and integrity of, of the applicant and the driver. If they're not being honest and, and they don't have integrity, then there's no way uh, that we can catch that 100% of the time because we're reliant upon other people seeing signs of what that is. What's not clear is how Bruce Pollard passed his medical exams despite a documented history of serious mental illness. What is clear is that a mother and her two daughters lost their lives in a crash that should never have happened. One thing that's unique about the trucking industry is that many truckers go days or even weeks without seeing their coworkers or supervisors. Of course, that complicates a company's ability to identify a mental health issue. Also, when companies get the results of those medical exams, the carriers may see results like hearing and vision, but they do not get to see anything regarding a driver's mental health. Sounds like a lot of hurdles out there. So should we feel safe on the roads knowing that they, a lot of uh, employers have to go through these hoops? We found there's actually a lot of stopgap measures in place to ensure that drivers on the road are fit to drive both physically and mentally. However, as we know, no system is perfect and sometimes things slip through the cracks. The Indiana Motor Truck Association says they fully support regulations that will improve safety and get dangerous drivers off the road. Well, Kara, you mentioned that Pollard pleaded guilty to these charges. Do we know his fate or when, when that might happen? He's going to be sentenced on March 27th. He will likely serve his sentence in a Department of Correction mental health facility. All right, our Kara Kenny digging deep tonight. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And tonight, police are trying to figure out the circumstances behind a shooting and multiple vehicle crash on Indianapolis's west side that left a woman dead and a man seriously hurt today. This happened in the area of Lafayette Road and 30th Street. That's where RTV6's Cameron Riddle is live tonight. He's been looking into this story. Cameron, what are you learning? Well, good evening. We've learned that IMPD officers were actually already here in the area and heard multiple gunshots and that crash themselves. Now tonight, they are trying to figure out how that crash that ended right here at 30th and Lafayette may have started as a shooting. Police tell us four cars in total were involved and two people were injured and were both taken to the hospital. IMPD says that unidentified male was taken to the hospital in serious condition. The woman was also transported to the hospital with a gunshot wound, but then later died at the hospital. Police have not identified the woman or said how she died, but they did say she was both shot and involved in this four car crash. We talked to a school bus driver who says she was in the area in her bus when police heard the shots and that crash. Somebody got on the radio to tell people to basically avoid the area because they believe People were dead in the cars, and they said, you know, there was an accident and police was coming. And actually, when I was going down 38th and um, getting off the highway at 38th and Lafayette, I seen police coming past, you know, get trying to get around me as I was coming on my bus. And tonight we have learned that is the direction that the cars were coming uh, coming south here on Lafayette Road, the same direction that bus driver was coming. Tonight, police have not released any details on who a suspect may be. So far, they have only said that this case is, quote, isolated and directed. Exactly what that means, we do not know, but we are still trying to figure that out tonight. In the meantime, IMPD is asking for the public's help with getting any tips and information on who may have been behind this morning's shooting. Reporting live on the city's west side, I'm Cameron Riddle, RTV6.
A disparity in home values in Marion County, predominantly black neighborhoods are the most affected and it's hurting many local communities. That's according to a new study from IUPUI. Working for you, RTV6's Megan Sanctorum goes to the experts for answers and finds out what needs to happen next. Their homes just like this and they're located in specific areas across Marion County. But because of their location in predominantly black neighborhoods, they're being undervalued, sometimes by around $40,000. It's crucial because homeownership is usually a major way to build wealth. Bianca Merritt has been studying this data for years. She says it also impacts these homeowners day to day life when you look at some of the things that could be causing the disparities. I think there are a lot of concerns about not just uh, the home value, but also what it means to live there in terms of access to amenities and other things that we know are important for um, assessing the value of not just a home, but an entire neighborhood. Some local realtors say this data is not surprising, and it's something they see when helping people find a place to buy. Schools is like a big thing. There's no place to go to the grocery store. Like maybe they don't feel safe. And they think investment in these neighborhoods from businesses and city leaders is the way to reverse this trend. We just need more. We need more support in those areas and it's just not there because people want to focus on, you know, Fountain Square downtown, which is fine, but it's like, yeah, these areas need attention as well. Researchers say completing this study and getting the numbers on paper was the first step. They hope the data can help prompt change for people in these neighborhoods, even if they are not looking to sell. Folks who are choosing to stay there are equipped with the same types of opportunities as people elsewhere. Working for you, Megan Sanctorum, RTV6. Researchers now plan to bring the data to local leaders and hold forums for people living in the impacted neighborhoods. After 94 years, an Indiana staple is gone. We're learning Indiana Beach Amusement Park on Lake Schaefer has shut down. That's according to the president of the White County Economic Development Organization who met with the park's owners this afternoon. Indiana Beach has been in operation since 1926 and has six roller coasters. It employed 800 to 900 seasonal workers per year. The Economic Develop Development Organization tells us Indiana Beach was the main economic driver of White County. Manufacturing has traditionally been a large part of Indiana's economy. But as technology has advanced, those jobs have changed. Hiring Hoosiers, the effort to expose students to the new era of manufacturing, the jobs that are now available in that sector. The journey of Joey Brunk, a standout at Southport, leading to a basketball scholarship at Butler. But following his father's death, Brunk chartered a new path to IU. Day first sits down with Joey Brunk in our Sports Extra Spotlight. And temperatures the story today as the colder air settles into central Indiana. I'm sure the question you're asking is when will we see sunshine? And in the western portion of the state now, some sun starting to poke through. That's foreshadowing where we're headed tomorrow. Forecast coming up. On the 2020 Ultima. This is RTV6 News at 6, working for you. Our Hiring Hoosiers initiative continues to connect you to jobs, resources, and training opportunities. And we've reported before on the organization called Indiana Next Generation Manufacturing Competitiveness Competitiveness Center, excuse me, or IMAC for short. The organization works to connect industry leaders in manufacturing to Indiana students and educators. And so here's a cool opportunity for your kids, the INMAC Design and Innovation Studios. This is a look inside the studio within Subaru of Indiana Automotive. Inside the 1,000 square foot space, students in grades 5 through 12 get to use 3D printers, robots, virtual reality, and more. The goal of the lab is to inspire a larger workforce for the next generation of manufacturing. The field trip shows students that manufacturing of today is high tech and full of opportunity. Every kid that has an opportunity to come to a factory, see the actual work that's being done, and then be able to come into a laboratory space like this and be able to touch and uh, operate some of the equipment will have a great sense of uh, what it's really like. And hopefully that stimulates them to think, maybe that's a good career for me. Maybe that's a good opportunity for me. These INMAC Design and Innovation Studios stretch farther than Subaru and Lafayette. 20,000 Indiana students are directly impacted by the studios, whether they are at places like Subaru, Fiat, Chrysler, or Honda. They also have studios in several area elementary schools. And if you want to learn more about these INMAC Innovation Studios and how to get your child in front of this unique learning experience, you can connect with them and learn more by visiting this story on our website, HiringHoosiers.com.
Next several days will be dry and colder, but a lot brighter as well. Beginning to see uh, the drier air arrive in the western portion of the state. That translates to breaks in the cloud cover and eventually, I think, a lot of sunshine tomorrow. High pressure will be off to our west. We'll sit on the cold side at least up to the weekend. At northwest, wind will continue to deliver Canadian air into the Great Lakes and the Hoosier State. That'll keep our temperatures below average. I think it's Friday morning morning that will have our coldest temperatures but prior to that coldest afternoon will be on Thursday only 29 for the high average this time of year 41 but we've been all over the place of course at times 41 has seemed quite cool because of how mild our conditions have been but we bounce around as you can see for the rest of the work week till we get to the weekend coldest temperature I think as we get to Friday morning will be in the lower teens that's most likely north and west of Indianapolis what's happening right now. Skies are clearing in the northwest portion of the state. We have showers in southeast Indiana exiting. That's just behind the cold front that moved through this morning and opened the door to the cooler air. Off to our northwest, skies are clearing. That will set the stage for some spots there to drop into the teens tonight. And the cloud cover will continue to make progress to the south and east by the time we get together at 10 and 11. Skies will be uh, partly cloudy to mostly clear. 37 in Marion, 37 in Frankfort. Temperatures in southern portions of the state still at 40 in Bedford, but yesterday you were at 52 at this hour. Wednesday, plan on sunshine, 32 the midday temperature, the high temperature just 37, and that's with partly the mostly sunny skies and a cool northwest wind. Just want to show you Thursday morning, I think the first half of Thursday, more cloud cover than the second half. Temperatures will be the coldest within the seven-day planner, consistently staying in the 20s through through the day. Some spots will struggle to hit 26 degrees to the north and uh, staying under 30 even to the south. There are temperatures Thursday afternoon compared to 41, your average high. Low temperatures, coldest on Friday morning to the north and west, 14 Logansport, Kokomo and Lafayette. Seven day planner just in time for the weekend. Temperatures come back up. 46 Saturday, maybe some snow at the beginning Saturday night, changing to rain for Sunday, and we'll continue the rain chances Monday and Tuesday. Dave? Kevin, thanks. Good evening to you. Important stretch in college basketball right now, just three weeks before the conference tournaments. IU looking for inspiration? They should look no further than Butler grad transfer Joey Brunk and Joey's inspiration in tonight's Sports Extra Spotlight. It's game day in Bloomington, a mix of the band, basketball, and these days, Joey Brunk, like it's been so many times before. How many times did you and your dad come to games here? I remember coming to games when I was little. Uh, here, obviously, I sat up there for the uh, IU Kentucky game when, 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 when Christian has Watford the shot. hit the shot. Outside the Watford, three on the way. Oh! It was one of the milestone victories in recent years. Joey and his younger brother Johnny would be seen here many other times, and Dad Joe would always lead the way. How often do you think about your dad when you're here? Uh, all the time. Yeah, all the time. I know he'd be proud. I know he'd be um, excited. I also know he'd have his have his complaints for me. Have his he'd have his he'd have his list of things that I should have done better. You know, he, I, I mean, let's be honest. He rode you yeah. pretty hard, right? Yeah. yeah I mean, I mean, I, I always could have got a few more rebounds or, or whatever, <laughs> whatever that is. You know, there there there, there would have been no shortage of that. In fact, Big Joe was in the middle of most of Joey's career, whether it's Southport High or signing day with Butler. April will mark three years since his passing after a battle with brain cancer. He picked me up, I mean, every day after school and middle school, and we went to, drove out to playing field to the recreation aquatic center, and, you know, that's, he, he, he loved doing it, you know. Yeah. He never, never had an issue, you know, getting up in the morning to um, go over to Southport with me and work out, you know, he loved doing all that. How much of all of that is leads to this, I guess. I mean, if I didn't have those moments, I never, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. Originally recruited by IU, he's here now and finds himself in the midst of his final two seasons with more determination than ever. Improved footwork, improved touch around the rim, and more. You made a very concerted effort to say, I'm going to change my body. I'm going to change maybe some attitude here. For myself personally, you know, it was, hey, I'm going to pour myself into this and um, you know, we're just going to see, we're going to see how it works out. 
among his first stops in Bloomington was to see the man with the whistle, the team's director of athletic performance, Cliff Marshall. He wanted to sit down right away and talk about his goals for the offseason. And I can remember him even asking me on his first day on, on, on campus here, he wanted to go ahead and start working out. Who does that? I know. It's, <laughs> it's uh, the first athlete I've ever had ask me, can he work out on the first day? Last summer, do you know how many hours you spent in this place or cook hall? Or uh, no, enough. Enough that uh, I think uh, myself and my roommate are probably regulars on the security camera whenever we, we come in. There's there's never any worries when we come in late at night because we're just the we're the regulars. We're we're pretty we're pretty good buddies with the with the cleaning crew whenever we come in the locker room. Part old school, part old soul. A player who perhaps has experienced more than some 22 year olds, but might also be succeeding more at the same time. What do you think your dad, what, what would Big Joe say about all of this now? I don't know. Yeah, I know. I know he'd have a lot to say there. So he, he, he was never uh, at, a, at a loss for words. Good, very yeah, often. that's accurate. You know, I think, I, don't know, I, I, just, I just, I think there'd be a lot of times where he'd probably just, you know, hopefully sit back and, you know, kind of, you know, take his, you know, just, just enjoy it and not have to and just be, and just be my dad. His dad was big on thank you notes, some funny, some sad, but all very meaningful. Joey is considering writing a book made up of thank you notes written to his father. Can't wait to read it. Purdue on the road and more at 11 o'clock until then. The News at 6 continues after that. Say hello to these two young men, yeah. Frankie and so Walter. Cute. And we've got their undivided attention, right? <laughs> they are ready to go. Notice the toys in the background, but they're still <laughs> ready to go for a walk, so let's roll. Temperatures, they'll be in the 30s through the evening hours. By the time we get to midnight, dropping into the 20s. Thanks to Jessica for sending in the pictures. They're all ears, aren't they? That's a cold, dulled walk. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully they're bundled up. Thanks for joining us here at 6 o'clock. And we'll see you at 7.